With the loss of through expresses and a tightened grip by Western Region, the Somerset and Dorset slipped back into being a country line. The upside of this was that the rundown to closure offered everyone easy access. No problem shed bashing. It's a pretty cold winter day here at Temple Coombe, where we're in telephoto mode for a couple of shots. The rail approach to the station is in the background. An incline led to typical southern architecture. At Temple Coombe station, the main line was steamy, even with diesel hydraulic. the real thing on the far side. That was probably the pilot to top and tail the Bournemouth train. Northbound trains departed normally. In driving around the area, items of interest appeared from time to time. Early one morning, we came across one of Wake's coaches who had famously held up closure from December 1965 to the following March, leading to a skeleton timetable. This permitted further filming. The Beeb were intensely interested too, and this impinged on us as we shall see. Here's the railway again. We've come to Wincanton. When we're back on track again, a northbound local is going to take us on to Evercreech Junction. The Cowan Gate factory, later Unigate, is close to the station. The descent into Evercreech Junction marks the end of relatively level territory. It was here that the BBC influence took over. We were on the footbridge close to them, not entirely to their liking, 
and the music occasioned by the Highbridge departure was for their benefit. Early on at Midford, we had found that microphone and camera should stay quite close for the proper sound perspective as seen on screen. So here at Evercreech Junction, on the final weekend, you see us doing just that. At a subsequent screening of the film Puffed Out, S&D stalwart Mike Palmer, now much missed, identified himself and family watching the last trains. At this point we had put a 1966 penny on the line. Could the sheer number of coins have led to wheel slip? Luckily, we found ours. On the branch, we had high hopes for a tracking shot. West of Glastonbury and Street, a road ran beside the line, ideal for a sports car with the top down. Here comes our train, but unfortunately, at speed, the road proved to be very bumpy. Then to cap it all, we ran into a herd of cows, so we just fell about laughing. Travelling across this almost level landscape, I was fascinated by the continual melting of exhaust into the trees. The line ran past the works and into Highbridge Station. Seeing me making sound recordings, the late Bill May very kindly invited me up onto his footplate, where I was closely followed by the cameraman. That's how we were able to record a wonderful impromptu interview with Bill. 
push the tank so much, I could only do a strike to cover it with a little milk. Then he ran out of the What are they going to do when you stop taking the tank, sir? I don't know, make an arrangement for that. What, by rail or by yeah, rail? Yeah, by rail. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, that's all covered. They ain't covering bits of bridge, they're making a sighting of this, you see. Oh, oh I yeah. Make the bridge, get down the crystal men on the floor, get the belt, top men, and in the week, the top men. <laughs> And uh, it had a Caverson crane for all the old night, brought by a steam engine in the corner, and, and a cotton rope was driven on a cotton rope, traveled up and down. All the work was done here. This was the main shop to this night. Burnham being closed, I expect, uh, around about 1953, 53, I expect, the last boat train was. Of course, it's taken up now. They used it for excursions. Uh, during the summer, they ran an excursion. Of course, you used to have quite a good service there one time. In fact, we used to have a, a London train out of there. Yeah. Oh. One forty-five on Saturday. Oh. And then right, which one now? Well, uh, which one did that go then? To Bristol. We used to oh, bring it out onto the, the down end. line and then the Western Indian to come yeah. out and look up and away. Milk and milk products had been a good customer. As Bill predicted, the factory at Basin Bridge retained its service for some time after closure of the whole system. Hymex themselves have long passed into history too, of course, except in preservation. Battling against winter weather needed great care at times, but did add veracity to our account. Ken is trying to get his exposure right here. The last snows added interest, but also underlined the difficulty of keeping the railway moving safely. We were lucky to get this shot late on a winter afternoon at Shapwick. The local hunt was clearly enjoying the weather. Before Bill May went on to the great railway in the sky, where trains never run late, he wrote that a driver was given ten shillings if the hounds stopped his train. At Shepton Mallet, early on a morning of tricky conditions, I was again lucky to have anything on film at all. The climb to Shepton passed through a deep cutting at Canard's grave. There was one last chance to film the effect, of which there are a few more seconds here than originally shown.
Travelling on this handwritten return ticket between Shepton Mallet and Binnegar, I filmed Windsor Hill Tunnel in both directions, again working camera and recorder alone. The only way that could be done was to put the sound recorder on a seat and leave it to its own devices. Ever looking to the future, you might say, the S&D already has EU on the ticket. That looks hopeful for a return journey. There's the chief cameraman arriving now. On the downside of the Mendips, there's a quick glimpse of Chilcompton Tunnel. After Midsummer Norton, we can depart from Radstock, where the line is hemmed in between the North Somerset line and roads, including the notorious level crossing. The line passes Rithlington Colliery and arrives at minute Shoscombe and Single Hill Halt, said to be surprisingly well used. On January the 2nd, 1966, we waited in sunshine at Wellow for the RCTS locos Exmouth and Pilot 31639 to return light, but they were about an hour late. This footage has been rescued. I'm seen here adjusting sound levels on the recorder. Having this facility allowed us to capture the Dot and Carry One tank and the atmosphere of a winter evening at Wellow with pressure lamps lit.
Moseying around after closure gave an additional photo opportunity. One could sense the ghosts of trains which recently passed this way. Additional footage allows us to see that the lady leaving the train appears to walk down the track to get home. The S&D crosses the Camerton to Limpley Stoke branch at Midfern and the Bath to Froome Road. After this glimpse of the sheds, we see a southbound departure from Green Park heading over the Western Region Line, filmed in a working lunch hour, probably without the lunch. There was a storm of protest, but the closure process had ground painfully on, and eventually only one locomotive, a pannier tank, was left in steam. Locomotives giving good service were all going, apparently, for scrap, but in fact were the springboard for standard gauge preservation.
Here at Avon Valley, in the foothills of the S&D, work continues on a rebuilt Pacific Battle of Britain class number 34058 Sir Frederick Pyle. Regaining Bath is the dream for this line. This was the day when Avon Valley Railway reached the River Avon, crossed it and arrived at the South Bank, a huge milestone. I asked director Gordon Ashton how he felt after that. Very pleased to be over the river bridge now. <laughs> A lot, lot of hard work and it's gone well today. The works train was the first to leave from Avon Riverside. It wasn't too long before some heavy metal was using those rails, XSMD 7F 53809. Memories were still bright of its appearance at Bath. <laughs> at Midsummer Norton, the fires burn again. Thanks to lots of hard work, in a few short years, this has given way to this. Restoration of the signal box was achieved partly with the help of video clips from Puffed Out. After about half a century, then, in other words, March 1966, has given way to now. Behind, 
This is Shillingstone now. And this is how I saw it from the window of a Bournemouth train, everything seemingly normal, but just days before services ceased. Happily, the station is firmly back on the road to recovery. You do have to beware. And from the ongoing projects at Shillingstone, of which the cattle dock is one, a single day of déjà vu at Shepton Mallet, courtesy of Mulberry. Coaling up and firing is a bit easier than on the 9F facing the Mendips. At Washford, note the crest on these two early coaches which are being restored. Amazingly, the Somerset and Dorset Railway Trust have the elaborate barrow used to carry the first sod cut for the Dorset Central in 1856, only about 30 years before those coaches were built. From the first sod to peat, Washford has narrow gauge track, locomotive and stock from Ashcott. Of special value to anyone making models is the collection of original drawings, including some signed by Alfred Whitaker. Not only are the original drawings held here, but a working example of the Whitaker tablet exchange apparatus is just outside. Constructed by architect A. L. Gray, there is a detailed model of Highbridge Station, and his drawings are here too. <laughs> a booklet. Oh, and you can see what he did. I mean, he did uh, wonderful little sketches of all the details, and then constructed the model from this primary detail which he uh, obtained. Mm. and with true architect's uh, flair.
Not a million miles away at Bishop's Lydiard, Taunton Model Railway Group have carefully and lovingly constructed an extensive Bath Green Park model. Some views can be uncannily like the real thing at times, especially when there's the sound of real steam outside. Sometimes, of course, the sounds are of teacups being stirred and sandwiches being munched. There's a lot of conversation going on with admirers, too. Not quite scale speed, of course. That's better. The S&D surveyed a line from the Chilcompton area to Froome through the then industrialised Nettlebridge Valley and even obtained an Act of Parliament. Never built, it has taken shape in Roger Newman's 4mm scale model. The line would have followed the course of the abandoned Dorset and Somerset Canal. One can so easily imagine traffic echoing through the valley in the way that it did around Wellow. There would have been a stop at Holcombe, which has just received a consignment of timber through Highbridge. The station site would have been at the bottom of Holcombe Hill. Roger has modelled it with the pub close by and there is the pub. So nearly Railway Inn or Railway Hotel perhaps. No doubt there would have been a level crossing here. Roger reminds us that things don't always go according to plan in more ways than one. Why is an English a China clay wagon with a Midland Railway hood doing in Nettlebridge Yard? Well, the answer is that the clay for the potteries came from Cornwall and the potteries being on the LMS system, the, the clay used to come up to Templecombe and then go up the Somerset and Dorset to Bath and on its way north to Stoke. But unfortunately that wagon uh, developed a fault near Odd Down and that's been put in Nettlebridge Yard whilst repairs are affected. This isn't a model, but a fortunate survivor at Templecombe. Not far away, one can return, courtesy of the Gartell family, to the S&D. There's the track bed and Gartel are extending back to Templecombe. It might be narrow gauge, but the experience is uncannily as it was all those years ago.
Slowly and amazingly, the S&D is being brought back to life. We may yet see a standard gauge Pines Express running again over S&D metals to original timings and with original menu.